А вот час назад от Зеленского, опять же, было заявление, что а, а, они, в том случае, если Путин применит, если Путин применит все-таки ядерное оружие на Украине, а, то мир найдет способ ликвидировать а, президента это, России. Это еще более бурный поток сознания. Я не могу комментировать эти вещи. Я не имею медицинского образования. Ушелла Фондерляйн имеет медицинское образование. А почему защищать свои интересы, мы сами попадаем а, под прицел? Во всяком случае, словесно. Слушайте, ну я не могу отвечать за психологическое состояние людей, которые многократно, ежедневно доказывают свою неадекватность. Спасибо. This is my video update from Larnica, Cyprus on this Sunday midday June the 25th. Let's talk about some news. Everyone in the comments always asks, where are all the people? All the people are, are at the beach <laughs> in Cyprus. That's where all the people are. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm kind of filming in the background. I'm just an observer. So we, we had the, the big events that went down over the, over the past couple of days in Russia with uh, Prigozhin. And we have some more, some more information on this deal that was worked out by Lukashenko and, uh, and Prigozhin. And according to the Kremlin spokesman Peskov, he said that uh, the criminal case against Prigozhin will be dropped. And he also said that Prigozhin will indeed be going to Belarus. He didn't uh, give any details as to as to uh, what exactly Prigozhin is going to be doing in Belarus. Though I imagine that he's going to be living a a quiet, low-profile life from here on out in Belarus. There are a lot of uh, a lot of analysts saying that uh, Putin's going to going to do this to him or do that to him when he's in Belarus? I don't think so. I mean, something tells me that uh, Prigozhin and, uh, and Lukashenko and Putin, they agreed that he can go to Belarus and just just lay low and, and that'll be that. I think that's what's going to most likely happen. But um, Peskov did mention that Prigozhin is indeed going to Belarus. He, uh, he also said that at the moment there are going to be no, at least that he's aware of, there are going to be no changes in, uh, in the defense ministry. He was asked by, by a reporter whether Putin uh, still trusts Shoigu and if the deal involved some sort of uh, change in the Ministry of Defense with Shoigu or Yerasimov, and Peskov replied that he has that he was not aware of any changes in the relationship between the president of Russia and the current head of the defense ministry, though we do have some, uh, some media outlets claiming that uh, Putin is expected to have a major meeting with the Ministry of Defense of Russia and the military leadership on Monday. So we'll see tomorrow exactly what what the fate, if any, of the Ministry of Defense will be after the events, easy chance, after the events that took place over the past couple of days. I, I don't know what Putin's relationship is to Yerasimov. Like, I don't know how, how good of friends they are, but uh, I know that Putin is friends with uh, Shoigu. Actually, I think they, they even holiday together. So we'll see what will happen there. My, my take on this is uh, that I, I don't think it would be a good idea to, uh, to change out Shoigu or Yerasimov. That's just my quick, quick take on, on the rumors that there's going to be some change at the Ministry of Defense because I think it would, it would, uh, it would mean that Putin agreed to Prigozhin's demands in a way, which kind of looks, looks a bit iffy. And, uh, and I think it would not, not look good for... For morale in general, you know, you're, you're involved in this conflict, in this SMO, and because of what Prigozhin did, you're going to, uh, to now remove the, the Minister of Defense and uh, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces at the same time. 
I don't know. I think that that kind of looks a bit a bit odd to me. But we'll see what happens at the meeting between uh, Putin and uh, the Ministry of Defense and the military on Monday. And um, let me actually let me just read you the uh, this tweet from Zlati seventy one, which which explains some of the the information that we know about the deal worked out between Lukashenko and Prigozhin, Prigozhin and, and the Kremlin. Peskov's full statement on the situation with Wagner PMC, soldiers of the PMC Wagner can sign a contract with the Russian Ministry of Defense. Uh, there will be no persecution against the participants of the military rebellion. The initiator of negotiations with Prigozhin was President Lukashenko. All participants in the negotiation pursued the highest goal to avoid bloodshed and internal confrontation. The situation will not affect the course of the uh, special military operation. The fighters successfully repelled the counteroffensive of the armed forces of Ukraine. There will be no new Putin address in the near future. So that's pretty much uh, a roundup as to what uh what was agreed on between lukashenko and uh and Prigozhin, according to the kremlin spokesman uh, peskov uh peskov did say that that uh the the wagner forces that were not part of this uh this mutiny will be folded into the russian uh, military i imagine that the soldiers that were part of this mutiny will not be folded into the russian military but uh, they will have immunity so the Russian government won't won't go after them, but I imagine they're they're not going to be allowed to serve in the Russian military. That's just my take on it. When you uh, read through Peskov's statements, I think he's very clear to say that that contracts will be given to Wagner soldiers who were not a part of uh, of this this uh, march march to Moscow, what did Prigozhin call it? The march towards Moscow, whatever he called it. So um, I, I made a mistake on, on my video yesterday evening, my final video update, and I said that uh, Rostov, where uh, Prigozhin started his march towards Moscow, the southern city of Rostov on Don, I said that it's like a five-hour drive to Moscow. I was way off there, and I apologize for that mistake. It's actually more around uh, a 10 to 12 hour drive. Um, quite, quite a ways away from, from Moscow. And uh, Larry Johnson, he, he sent me an email and he, he made a really good point. He said that if you have this big military convoy, most likely you're driving something like 60, like, like 60 to say 70 miles an hour. That, that would make, the trip from Rostov to Moscow, something like like a 20 hour drive, uh, give or take. So, um, you know, I was thinking to myself uh, as I was reading uh, Larry's uh, email and Larry made the point as well that uh, negotiations were, were ob obviously taking place as this convoy with Prigozhin in it as they were driving towards Moscow. Um, obviously, Lukashenko, the Russian government, the Kremlin, uh, Maybe even Putin himself. Obviously, they were they were talking to Prigozhin and and uh, negotiating with Prigozhin on this very long, let's say, twenty hour drive to uh, to Moscow. And and when I go on uh, on a long drive, as I'm sure many of you watching this video uh, also do, if you if you go on long drives, road trips, or you enjoy driving uh, some distances. You know, it does give you a lot of time to, to think, <laughs> doesn't it, when you're on the road. And so I imagine, I imagine that a lot of the, the Wagner soldiers, maybe even Prigozhin himself, as they were embarking on this march towards Moscow, that as they were driving on, on the highway, they were probably like, you know, whoa, what are we doing? <laughs> what, what are we doing? This is madness. You know, what's the whole purpose of all of this? What exactly is the goal? Um, you know, I bet you when the trip started, like maybe the first hour or two, everyone's probably like pumped up. Yeah, yeah man, we're going to go to, to Moscow. We're going to, to get to uh, the Ministry of Defense. Um, I think the Ministry of Defense is, is right across the street from uh, uh, Parque Gorkava, Gorky Park, in uh, the metro stop Parque Culture. If I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, I think I still remember the metro stop for... For where the Ministry of Defense is located. It's actually a beautiful view right across from, 
from the river. If, you're, if you ever go to Moscow and you go to Gorky Park, there's like a really beautiful view of the, of the Ministry of Defense. It's a beautiful park. Anyway, uh, I imagine that the first couple of hours, they were all like, yeah, we're going to go to the, to the Ministry of Defense and we're going to park right outside the Ministry of Defense and we're going to call out uh, Shoigu, you know, like, uh, like a streetcar named Desire, <laughs> you know, with, uh, with Marlon Brando, you know, Stella, Stella, Shoigu, Shoigu. <laughs> but um, I I'm sure like maybe four, five, six hours in, everyone's probably like, you know, oh man, what are we doing here? Got another 10 hours to go. This is ridiculous. <laughs> oh boy. And Larry made a really good point too. He's probably like, how do you, how do you stop for food or get gas? You know, you have this big military convoy. You pull up to, to, uh, the, the gas station, the, uh, the, uh, the the Luke Oil uh, Rosneft gas station, you know, f fill it up, uh, <laughs> fill it up, my man. We're gonna uh, also need some water and some food for for all of these soldiers. <laughs> I'm just trying. I'm, I'm just picturing all of, all of this stuff, thinking what a what a ridiculous idea to drive a convoy to Moscow, and and you know the point of, in all of this. And here's my point: is Putin knew this. Putin knew this, and I'm positive that. That Putin said, you know what, let them uh, start to make their way towards Moscow. We'll negotiate this thing. We'll de-escalate this thing. And, uh, and before they, they even get close to Moscow, we'll, we'll sort this thing out. And that's exactly what happened. And then the live stream we did yesterday with, uh, with Alexander on the Duran channel. Ale Alexander, he also said that uh, Putin's going to solve this in, in 24 hours. He needs to solve this in 24 hours. That's going to be the goal, to solve it quickly and to make it go away. And that's exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened. And in my morning video, when I was like in, in the water talking about the situation before Putin's speech, I said at the end of the video that, uh, that, I, hope, that I hope that Putin can, can find an off-ramp to this and... Uh, and there's no uh, violence and everything works out and Prigozhin can kind of just go away in peace and everything sorts itself out. And, and I think that was like the last 30 seconds of my video. And that's, thank God, that's, uh, that's what, uh, what happened. And that was the goal. Peskov said in a statement, the goal was to avoid violence. And uh, I think that was, that was without a doubt the right idea. Because if you had a violent event happen that, that would have been awful. I mean, that would have really, really been awful. Now, there, there are uh, many analysts who said that there was some violence in the beginning. I mean, you're hearing reports of, of planes shot down or helicopters shot down. And then you're hearing reports that nothing was shot, shot down and, and uh, there was no real, uh, real violence or loss of life. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Um, but the the convoy moving towards Moscow and these thousands of Wagner soldiers, that, that, uh, that movement towards Moscow, luckily we didn't have any violence there. We didn't have a huge confrontation or a huge conflict break out. And uh, Peskov said that as well, that uh, violence was avoided, bloodshed was avoided, avoided, a big confrontation was avoided, and I think that was the main goal. Peskov said that was the main goal, and I think that was Putin's main goal. You know, Putin brought up 1917 in his speech, but, um, you know, 1905, you had the, uh, the uh, Bloody Sunday massacre in St. Petersburg. One of these events, they, they don't lead to the downfall of a government, or at that time, the downfall of, uh, of the czar, the abdication of, of the czar. But when you have a lot of these events take place over time, you know, so 1905, and then you had more violent events break out up until 1917. That's when you start to get uh, a revolution. That's when a revolution starts to, starts to form. And uh, I think Putin is, is a student of, uh, of history. He knows his history. He understood this. He understands this. And uh, he understood that, yeah, I could, I, I could stop this madness with my military right away and, and uh, annihilate this, this convoy. But if I did that, 
maybe this this time I would be okay. But if we have another violent event and another violent event, well, then, you know, public opinion starts to change. And, and Putin understood this. And I think this was a huge win um, for the Putin government because they avoided violence. They negotiated. They used uh, uh, diplomacy negotiations. They brought in Lukashenko, a big win for Lukashenko as well. He must be very, uh, very happy. And, uh, and within 24 hours, this whole thing was, was over. So uh, know your history. I think Putin absolutely knows his history and he understands that, that if he took a different route to this, well, then it would have, uh, it would have been bad. It would have uh, been bad for, for Russia, not even for his administration, but for Russia in the future. So um, the, the media, <laughs> the media on the collective West, boy, did they, did they lose their minds over, over everything that happened yesterday. They wanted this coup. Well, they called it a coup. They wanted this coup so, so bad. And, and there's a reason why they call it a coup, even though uh, we, we did a live stream yesterday with Alexander and we were like, this is, this is not a coup because Prigozhin's not even directing this towards Putin. He's directing this towards Shoigu. And uh, that, that doesn't make it a coup, but um, the, the Collective West, they ran with the whole coup thread and uh, the, the articles that came out, the titles that came out were just off the charts. I'm pulling up uh, some of these posts right now. Uh, the New York Post, they say Russian rebellion, mercenary leader vows to march on Moscow, impossible coup. Uh, the Washington Post says in Russia, a short-lived revolt. Sunday Telegraph says Wagner, mutineers turn back after striking deal with Putin. The Sun on Sunday says Putin at the brink. Humiliation as rebels close in on Moscow. He clings on after desperate 11, 11th hour deal. Sunday Times says Putin humiliated by mutiny. The Observer says rebel chief halts tank advance on Moscow to stop bloodshed. And the Mail says, did Putin bribe coup leader to quit Russia? And the Mirror says, Putin pushed to brink. Yeah, oh boy, <laughs> it goes on and on and on. Uh, Bloomberg, they ran uh, a headline. The Wagner mutiny foreshadows a Russian defeat. Prokosian's escapades shows Putin's war in Ukraine isn't going well for him. <laughs> boy, did they want this so, so bad. They really, really wanted this, this quote-unquote coup, the coup. They wanted this thing to happen. That's my clown world, by the way. My clown world's going to focus on a Wall Street Journal uh, headline that I think sums up the, the craziness, <laughs> the confusion and the craziness of the collective West media. Wagner, a couple of months ago, they were, they were the most evil organization on earth. And just yesterday, they were uh, freedom fighters. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Absolutely crazy stuff. So uh, Kadyrov, he also issued a statement about the, everything that uh, took place yesterday and uh, after the deal was, was struck between Lukashenko and Prigozhin, Kadyrov said, and I quote, I thought that some people can be trusted, that they sincerely love their motherland as real patriots to the marrow of their bones. But it turned out that for the sake of personal ambitions, profit, and because of arrogance, people cannot give a damn about affection and love for the fatherland. So that is what Kadyrov said in a statement. He, uh, he, really, uh, he really rallied his support behind Putin. No doubt that Kadyrov is, uh, is someone that Putin can, uh, can trust. He is, uh, he's loyal to... To Putin and to Russia, that's the way it looks with, uh, with the statement from Kadyrov. And uh, I think that's, that's just about everything with this Prigozhin wagner chapter, which I believe now will come to a definitive close. Um, the Russian military, they're going to, to fold whatever parts of Wagner they want to into the Russian military, whatever parts they don't want to fold into the Russian military. They're going to they're gonna be immune from any types of uh, criminal charges, but I imagine they're going to now just be uh, living a, a civilian life. 
And Prigozhin, you can call it exile. You can call it a nice long holiday. I don't know, but uh, I hope. I hope that Prigozhin uh, goes to Belarus. I hope that he gets gets uh, gets help. I think he needs help. And um, I hope he lives a, a low-profile, quiet, uh, quiet life. And, and and I hope this is the end of of all of this. But uh, Putin came through this, and I think he showed tremendous leadership. I said in my video yesterday that the Russian Foreign Ministry, they're going to be working over the weekend to call friends, partners, allies to uh, start doing some damage control and to start explaining the situation and, uh, and to start reassuring allies that all is well in, uh, in Russia and the Putin government is in firm control of the situation. And that is exactly what happened uh, yesterday with Lavrov calling the, the Iranian foreign minister and uh, he called him and voiced uh, and, and filled him in on, uh, on the situation and the Iranian foreign minister voiced support for, for Moscow. He said that Iran has, uh, uh, that Iran has Moscow's back. And, uh, and then they talk business. <laughs> then they talk business. The Iranian side expressed support for the actions of the Russian leadership to ensure constitutional order. And then they talked about bilateral ties between Russia and Iran, stressing their high dynamism and expressing their eagerness to further boost cooperation. This is according to the Iranian and Russian foreign ministry. So Iran is no stranger to these types of events either. And they understand uh, what Russia went through. And the Iranian foreign minister, he spoke with Lavrov and said, uh, we we support you guys. So, so all is good. Let's get back to business. And that's what I think the Russian foreign ministry is going to be doing throughout this, this next week, calling up their partners and allies and and uh, just filling them in on on everything that is going on and the resolution that was reached and uh, getting back to business. The, the G7, they also had a, a telephone call. Blinken and the foreign ministers of France, Germany, UK, Italy, Canada, they all got on, uh, on Zoom. <laughs> I imagine they got on Zoom or maybe they got on WhatsApp. Definitely not te not Telegram, but uh, they got on uh, on the Zookbots WhatsApp, and they made a they had a conference call and they talked about uh, the the drama in Russia and how they're going to handle things. And uh, Joseph Burrell, this is this is great. Jungle Joseph, he uh, he wrote in a tweet, and I quote: "Had a call with G7 foreign ministers to exchange views on the situation in Russia." Ahead of Monday's EU Foreign Affairs Council, I am coordinating inside the European Union and have activated the Crisis Response Center. Morell added, our support to Ukraine continues unabated. And Blinken also said that uh, the U.S.'s support for Ukraine is, uh, is unchanged. It's not changed. The United States will stay in close coordination with allies and partners as the situation continues to develop. Blinken reiterated that support by the United States for Ukraine will not change for as long as it takes, <laughs> for as long as it takes. I love how Jungle Joseph talks about activating the EU Crisis Response Center. <laughs> I wonder what that room looks like. <laughs> Jungle Joseph calling uh, the EU Crisis Response Center. We've got a crisis, uh, EU Crisis Response Center. <laughs> we, we have a coup in Russia. What do we do? <laughs> this is Jungle Joseph. What do we do? What's our next move? Oh, boy. <laughs> so um, I think I'll, I'll wrap this video up. Uh, let, let me do one more, one more story here, and then I'll get to my clown world. And... This has to do with a New York Times article, which uh, which came out yesterday, and it claims, according to anonymous sources in the Biden White House, anonymous officials interviewed by the New York Times, they claim that the Biden administration they uh, they knew what was going on with uh, with Prigozhin and Wagner on Wednesday. They knew that a coup, a coup d'état 
was brewing. A coup d'etat against Shoigu <laughs> was, uh, was brewing. And uh, they filled in Joe Bidenopoulos, Greece's favorite son, as to what was being cooked up by Prigozhin, according to unnamed U.S. officials interviewed by the New York Times, the administration of, of U.S. President Joe Biden and military commanders were briefed on the Wagner preparations. As early as Wednesday, as additional details came in, another briefing attended by a narrow group of congressional leaders was reportedly held on Thursday. According to the New York Times sources, prior to the uprising, Washington officials were in no hurry to alert Russian President Vladimir Putin of an impending threat as they feared that Moscow could accuse them of orchestrating a coup. Moreover, the U.S. had little interest in helping Putin amid the Ukraine conflict and Russia's standoff with the West, the article says. Still, U.S. officials were reportedly alarmed by a possible conflict between Prigozhin and Moscow as they worried that Russia's descent into chaos could create considerable nuclear risks. Risks. The New York Times report was echoed by CNN, which claimed on Saturday that U.S. officials had believed Prigozhin was planning to challenge the Russian military for quite some time, but did not know what his ultimate goal was. Well, his goal was to call out uh, Shoigu to get into the octagon <laughs> to, uh, to, to have a fight. You know, Shoigu, get out here. Me and you, mano a mano. <laughs> that was Prigozhin's goal. <laughs> Oh, boy. Um, so, so what's the purpose of this New York Times article? Well, and the CNN article, because the CNN corroborates the New York Times reporting. Well, basically, you know, the Joe Biden uh, intel apparatus, the Joe Biden administration, they're on top of things, right? They know what's going down, and, uh, and they were aware of everything that was going on. So they had all of the, the intel to, uh, to be to be aware of Prigozhin's moves days in advance, but um, they didn't uh, warn Russia because they were afraid that Russia would say they were, they were, uh, they were helping Prigozhin in this coup attempt. And the New York Times also said that, uh, that the Biden White House didn't want to notify Putin because, you know, we don't want to help him out. <laughs> we don't want to give him any help. We prefer uh, Wagner. Uh, overthrowing the, the Russian government in this coup d'etat. <laughs> this coup d'etat against Shoigu. The coup d'etat against Shoigu. But uh, the real purpose of this article, this is what I think the real purpose of this article, all jokes aside, the real purpose of this article was so that they can hammer home the, the nuclear narrative again. That's, that's it. All of this other stuff is nonsense. They knew about what Prigozhin was up to, just like U.S. intel knew that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. You know, come on. Come on, man. <laughs> Who are you guys trying to fool here? The, the purpose of articles like this is so that they can talk about the instability in Russia and how this is a, a nuclear threat. Which worries me because they're, 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 they're constantly talking about nukes. This, this whole nuclear thing is is on their minds 24-7. And uh, every article that they post now about Russia and Ukraine and everything that's going on inside of Russia, it always has some sort of nuclear threat angle. And that's what worries me. That's what worries me. And that was the purpose of this, of this New York Times reporting from these anonymous officials. Russia's not stable. Putin's not stable. And this guy has a lot of nukes. It's a nuclear threat. What do we do? Maybe we need to get involved in Ukraine. I don't know. Maybe we need to put boots on the ground, right? That's, that's the whole purpose of all of this. Give them F F-16s. Give them attack ups. Give, uh, give them nuclear weapons so they can deter Russia, according to some neocons. And they're uh, thinking on this thing. So that was the purpose of, of that article. I'm trying to see if I've got any more stories that I want to get out to, to you here before I do my clown world. The uh, deputy uh, defense minister of Ukraine, Anna Malyar, she said yesterday that uh, as all of this stuff was going down, the Ukraine military, they advanced two kilometers into Bakhmut and they were making huge progress. And uh, today, the Ukraine general staff, they said that Malyar's statements that they were making progress towards uh, Artyomovsk, Bakhmut, was nonsense. So the general staff, the military of Ukraine, had to actually call out the deputy defense minister on her lies. 
pretty incredible. Uh, the, the forces that are making progress, well, it's the Russian forces. Bryansk and Marinka. And there was, there was uh, some significant missile strikes that, that took place over the past couple of days. And I think one missile strike actually took out uh, a warehouse of UK Storm Shadow missiles. And a lot of this stuff was not being reported on because everyone was was fixated on on Prigozhin's antics. And, uh, and how about this uh, tweet from Robert Barnes, the great Robert Barnes? It's uh, I guess it's a reply. It's a reply tweet. If that's what you call it. Anyway, this guy Ross uh, Gerber he tweeted, "It's very possible Prigozhin will be the next leader of Russia. Putin is on the run. Moscow is being attacked." And the Russian military is in shambles. The end game is here. Hashtag Ukraine. <laughs> and Robert Barnes tweets on top of this, this screen grab. He says, your typical Western expert on Russia. Set a record for being wrong. <laughs> well played, Robert. <laughs> well played. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got all kinds of tweets like this over the past couple of days. You know, uh, Wagner controls all of Rostov. They control the whole city. Nonsense. Patrick Lancaster, he... Uh, he gave a report on uh, on the live stream that took place uh, with Alex and, uh, and Brian at the New Atlas, and uh, they had a, a video report from Patrick, and Patrick's like, dude, Wagner doesn't control all of Rostov. Rostov's a pretty big city. I think it has a population of like a million uh, people. It's not it's not like a small city. It's not like Larnica. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's actually a, a decent sized city. And the Wagner, you know, they, they parked their tanks in a certain part of the city, but they weren't controlling the entire city. That's, uh, that's nonsense. But you got all kinds of crazy reports yesterday coming out about this. Putin's military is in shambles. Putin's leadership's in shambles. Prigozhin's going to be the next, uh, the next leader of Russia. And, and this is proof that Russia is losing the conflict and all of these things. Which is, you know, that was... That's one of the things that I was talking about in, I think, two of my videos yesterday. I was, you know, I was expecting these stories to come out, as I'm sure you're, you're, you're expecting these stories to come out. And we're going to see a lot of stories like this over the next six months. I mean, Prigozhin has given the collective West media a new Ghost of Kiev, Snake Island, Siege of Kiev narrative that they're going to milk for, for the next six years, right? Anyway, that's that's the media. They're going to run with this story for a long, long time. Whatever. And on that note, let's uh, let's do my clown world, and we'll wrap this video up. And this clown world, it comes from the Wall Street Journal, and they ran an article with the title. This is great. This is absolutely great. U.S. to delay new sanctions on Wagner for fear of siding with Putin. <laughs> when I saw this screen grab on various Telegram channels and Twitter accounts, I thought this was a joke. I thought this is Photoshop. There is no way that this is real. This has got to be Photoshop. And uh, then I went to the Wall Street Journal, and sure enough, it's real. The Wall Street Journal, U.S., to delay new sanctions on Wagner for fear of siding with Putin. <laughs> oh, man. All right. I think that's the video. By the way, a couple of days ago, the Alensky regime announced that there will be no elections in Ukraine until the end of the war. In accordance with the law, elections must be held in peacetime when there are no hostilities, Alensky said. So, uh, so Alensky, he is not going to have elections. I, I, I thought Alensky, I thought Ukraine was this, this shining example of, of democracy. I guess not. I guess not. No one's, no one's really talking about this in the collective West media. They're not really running with this statement, this announcement from Alensky that he's just going to cancel elections. Canceled. All right, that's the video, everyone, at thedoran.locals.com. We are on Odyssey, Rumble, Bitchute, Telegram, and Rockfin, and go to the Duran shop. Use the code GOODDAY, 10% off. Any volleyball players? 
watching this uh, this video, let me know in the comments down below. And uh, free Assange, free Gonzalo Vera, and free Pablo Gonzalez. Take care.